Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show hosted by a French professor who's going to be reviewing the album Is This For Real? by Koreatown Oddity. I reviewed one of his features on the J-Rock album from a couple weeks ago, but I wasn't ready for how good of a rapper he is, what a great producer he is. Really, I was not ready for this album. This is the first time I've listened to him. I missed his last couple projects. I don't know, I review a lot of music. Uh, and the main thing that I'm, I'm reminded of by listening to this is how important comedy is in hip hop, or how important it should be, or how lacking it is when it's not there. I mean, in the old days of hip hop, <laughs> comedy was an integral part. I mean, not only like with acts like the Fat Boys or acts like Bismarcky, but even, you know, Rapper's Delight, the first rap song to make it into the mainstream, has an entire verse about bad chicken and about Superman's sperm, right? There's, there's, there is a lot of comedy in hip hop, but there was some time, I don't know, in the late 80s, early 90s, the, the sort of what hip hop could express got narrowed down into sort of a kind of aggression or a reaction to that aggression, and a lot of that comedy went away. Well, fortunately, I fixed the camera there. Fortunately, over the last decade, over the last few years, I don't know, the amount of expression that is allowed in hip hop has sort of opened back up again. It's more emotional than ever, it's more honest than ever, and with acts like this, it's funnier than ever. And the thing that's important is that comedy serves a couple of functions. I mean, one, it's a great way to tell the truth. It's a great way to communicate the truth. Uh, especially if you're dealing with trauma or feelings of not being good enough, which most human beings are, and uh, rappers as well, it's a good way to express those things. Uh, but also, you know, comedy is a function of intellect. So if you're super smart, usually you tend to really like comedy. That's just, there's often a, a parallel there. So again, if, if, if we're not allowing a space in hip hop for comedy, we might be sort of boxing out some of the smartest people who could be making this music or could be contributing to this culture. So I listened to this album, I don't know, three or four times? Um, four times before reviewing it. And after the first listen, I found out that you can actually find this guy's comedy on YouTube. His real name is Dominique Purdy. And this is, there's some chance he'll see this. There's a chance he doesn't know this. Maybe he's already sampled it. This is the first time I've ever listened to his music. So what, what do I know? Uh, the singing nun, Sur Sourire in French, uh, was this crazy interesting figure in the 60s who, uh, like she's a nun, but she has a song about uh, birth control and how great it is. She's wild. She like ended up like, leaving the church and marrying a woman and dying of a drug overdose, a fascinating woman. But she was very popular for this song uh, that's called Dominique, which is his first name. And it's pretty popular in France <laughs> because she sings it like this, Dominique, Nick, 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 over and over again. And the word Nick is the F word in French. So anyways, there's some comedic potential there to have some sort of French person saying his name, which Dominique is often a, a name that gets people to laugh in French. So I watched some of his comedy. And he doesn't go by Koreatown Oddity, he goes by Dominique Purdy. And it was good, but it wasn't as good as his music, and it wasn't as funny as his music. His straight comedy was not as funny as his music. And I think the added benefit is that there's a certain emotional punch behind the music behind the music that the comedy didn't carry. So you know, he made one joke, which is funny because it's a joke I've been making myself for the past 30 years. The first time someone took me to Johnny Rockets and said, isn't this place great? It's just like the 50s. I was like, no, I don't like it. Because if I were to be accurate, I, I would request to not be seated in the same restaurant as any, but any person of color in here. I'm not going to glamorize the 50s. I'm not going to glamorize the pre-civil rights era. Seriously. Like, I, I said that when I was like 17 years old. You can ask my friend Mark. He actually lives kind of close to Koreatown. He's out in LA. So, you know, he has a joke about that, which is great. You know, that kind of observational humor. He has a sort of funny series of jokes about how he eats burgers and fries like a kung fu movie. Like he goes through all the fries and then the, <laughs> the burger is the final boss. That's actually pretty funny. The more I think about it, the funnier it is. But it doesn't have the punch, the humor, the depth of his music. So I'm happy that he's not Dominique Purdy, that he is Koreatown Oddity. I mentioned in my last video about J-Rock that I've been to Koreatown a couple times. The best thing to do there is to go to one of the, uh, 
driving ranges at night. So they have these like five story driving ranges and you can just hit a golf ball into the pitch black. There's something about it that's very meditative and enjoyable. So it's not like he's alone in this space. Right? It's not that Koreatown Oddity is the only funny person here. Um, I don't know if they hang out or not. I don't know if Open Mike Eagle and Koreatown Oddity are at all connected. I have no idea. They're both funny rappers who I believe live in LA and I believe both have had careers in comedy. That's what this album reminds me the most of, that beautiful album from Open Mike Eagle last year, which is one of my favorite albums of last year. It also reminds me of the Joy Badass album that came out last week. I mean, Joy Badass is much different, much more mainstream. He has Puff Daddy on his album. Uh, but the fact, that, the fact that I just went through the Joy Badass album and he's quoting Flight of the Concords and talking about Larry David... I don't know. And then also, I saw on YouTube this interview with Kevin Hart and Jay-Z, and it was also a kind of interesting reminder of how close the entertainment fields are and how often the, the life of an African-American entertainer versus the life of an African-American... You know, like, African-American entertainers share a very similar life experience, even if one's in comedy and one's in music. Uh, it was interesting to kind of see that all together. But it's all kind of anchored by this great music, this great production, you know... I don't want to use the word idiosyncratic because it's like, it's a cheesy ass, like seven syllable word. Idiosyncratic. Uh, yeah, seven syllables. <laughs> See, I'm also a comedian. Uh, uh, but I mean, it's a pretty good description. You know, he's pretty far out there. He produces everything himself except for one song. The thing that I like the most that he does is his production's good, it's interesting, it's filled with quotes that you can't really place. I'm going to make some guesses about where some of these sounds come from, but I'm not going to be certain. Uh, but, but he uses a lot of different voices, and this might be because he's an actor or a comedian, or it might just be this is his talent, but at times it feels like there's multiple people on the same album. So I'm going to give you a stamp, an example song. Click right above the banana there. It's called Hello, and it's a great example of the, the sadness and the humor that's all kind of mixed together in this album. A very fun, silly beat with all these voices in the background. So much happening, voices upon voices. You're not coming out. What makes you think you're not coming out? These like laughing sounds, this screech. I'm going to tell you who I think that screech belongs to. I have a theory, but I'm going to save that for later. Remind me to tell you about the screech. Not screech. Not dust and diamond. May he rest in peace. I'm talking about the screech and the sound. He's dead, right? Didn't screech die? I don't remember. So anyways, we have all these crazy, crazy sounds going on in the beginning. And then a drum beat comes in. And then like a sitar sound. And then like that other, like, there's like the individual notes of a sitar in Indian music. And then there's that kind of droning sound. It might even be a different instrument that's in the back. And these loud, sloppy drums. And then these shiny, shiny metal sounds. <laughs> Piercings, distorted and feeding back. And it's all so crazy. And then it starts off with this chorus. Yo, hello, is there a single soul out there? I feel alone, I feel stuck. I wish someone would throw me a rope and pull me out of this hole. Funny, funny, right? This funny idea of him being in a hole not being able to get out. Except, it's not funny. <laughs> Have you ever felt like you were in a hole and you couldn't get out? I felt that way in my life. I don't feel that way now. I'm doing pretty well, it's nice. Right after this video, I'm going to go install an infant car seat in my van. So, you know, I'm doing all right. But I felt this way in my life. Yo, hello, is there a single soul out there? You know, playing with these O sounds. Hello, yo, soul, rope, hole. And he's just stuck in this hole. And then he uses his talent with voice and with comedy. The first person who comes in the first verse is this slimy, Hey down there, can I give you a hand? This reptilian man who is representing temptation. And ultimately, even though he could get out of this hole with this person's help, he doesn't. Because it's representing something bad. It's selling out. It's selling his soul. It's a devil. It's something not right. And it got a lot darker once I made that decision. So here he is, and he's kind of drawing it all together. And he's like making it clear that 
because he resisted the easy way out, selling his soul. A lot of this album appears like he's he he's had to like turn down a lot of bad record deals. <laughs> I get the sense that that that's sort of in the background of this album. Uh, and then he gets this chorus where it's a lot quieter this time. A lot of that noise is quieter. The sitar, it's a sloppier version. He sang all that yo stuff again, but it's a lot lower. He doesn't say it all. He doesn't repeat it. It feels like he's at the bottom of the hole and, and just not able to get out. And like, he can't even say all these things. I actually just watched Silence of the Lambs for the first time in like a decade yesterday. So I'm sort of picturing him in that little hole with the you know lotion in the basket and getting the hose again. Could someone throw me a hose? And then he adds in this like idling car sound. <laughs> There's just so much agitation that you really feel like you're in this hole with him. Now the next verse has the next person who's going to help him out. Now a crew of clowns is circling around. And then there's a crusty the clown style laugh. <laughs> this guy watches The Simpsons. I'd never been more sure of anything in my entire life. This guy and I could sit around and quote Simpsons to each other for hours. I'm fairly certain of it. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Tell me in the comments if I'm right or wrong. Or don't. Damn it! Smash the like bucket. I always forget. There's no way... Everyone left. Everyone left before I said to smash the like bucket. Now no one's gonna like this video and my algorithms aren't gonna aren't gonna go up. Anyways, please subscribe and smash the like bucket. And check out my Reddit and TikTok and Instagram and all that garbage. So here he is. He's in there and he's in the hole and a crew of clowns is circling around the hole in the ground that I currently inhabit. One of them reached down and said, take my hand and grab it. Now he's a funny guy and his delivery is weird and here he's doing another voice. Take my hand and grab it! Like kind of like a funny voice, not a menacing voice. But I love the way he's playing with these, with these lines, like circling around the hole in the ground I currently inhabit, reached down and said, take my hand and grab it. It's like the grab it is rhyming with the inhabit, and then the ground, down, around, clown, that's all kind of rhyming in there. And then of course the arm falls off and the goofball squad is laughing. Does Koreatown Oddity have a name for his fans? I would like to put forth that we call ourselves the Goofball Squad. I just love the word goofball. <laughs> I mentioned this in a review recently, a Makami review. I just love the word goofball. My buddy Brad used to work with, uh, <laughs> work with this guy <laughs> who, who would say in a very menacing accent, that guy's a real GB, goofball. Anyways, the goofball squad is laughing. So here we have this guy who's stuck in a hole. He can't get out. First guy is the devil, so he doesn't go out. Second guy says he's going to help, and then he doesn't. I suppose this represents his friends, his community, his family, the people around him who he wants to depend on but can't because they're all just sitting there laughing at him. Then we get to the third verse, and finally someone arrives to pull out. He's got a long beard, and he looks into the sun, and he sees that it's himself. It's a funny song, it's an interesting story, and it's meaningful, because that's actually <laughs> the only way you get out of that hole. Jodie Foster is not coming through that door. Clarice Starling is not coming through that door. Like, you have to get yourself out of the hole. And so this image of himself when he's older, letting himself out, is actually, <laughs> it's like meaningful. I get it that this song is funny and in Goofball Squad and this guy's name is Koreatown Oddity and ha 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 ha. But when I think about what got me out of the hole, like I got out of the hole by instilling the, like, by like relying, having faith that I would get to where I am right now. Like if I go back to when I was 22, right, half my life ago, I think about the hole I was in, sitting in a apartment in Marseille and just losing my mind and just terrible, terrible times. Like, if I could go back, like, if I got out of that hole and it was like just a version of me with just, you know, some wrinkles around the eyes and a little bit of a gray beard, like, I'd get it. So, ha 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 ha, this guy's funny, he's doing lots of voices, let's just dismiss him. But then also, what a great song about how do you get out of a hole that you're in for your life. So, let's go through the rest of the album a little bit quicker. Quick, uh, quick plug, if you like comedy, uh, the, the work of Rabelais, is a, he's a French author from the, seriously, the 1500s, who writes about buttholes and, 
and very, very funny way, uh, but he also has a lot of very deep truths. If you ever like want to be reminded that the, the truth comes through comedy, Rabelais is one of the people to do that. So let's go through the, uh, the album a little bit quicker. It starts off with the opening con uh, confession, <laughs> this kind of like bossa nova beat, <laughs> just hello, and he says all the possible people who can be there, all these, a whole bunch of words which are not racial slurs, but might be, so I'm not going to say them, just kind of a comedic effect. And then we have this conceit of the whole album where he says, I am not American, I am, I am not an American Negro, I am a British N-word. And he changes his accent. And this is the introduction of this joke that's gonna be following through. And ha 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 ha, it's a funny joke, he's doing an accent. Oops, it's actually a really serious point about code switching and about the pressures on African Americans to behave and speak in a certain way depending on where they are and the kind of hell that they have to live in to perform different versions of blackness for different people, be they black or white, that is a difficulty that I don't have to face because of the privilege that I was born into with this skin and this accent. <laughs> it's funny. You get it? It's a funny joke that's serious as hell. I like this guy. He doesn't look like... The comedy, though, he didn't have, like, long, crazy hair. Like, I don't know if he's, like, wearing a wig when he's performing or if the comedy was from years ago. I don't know. The, the first sort of real song is called Fundraisers, which starts off with these kind of, like, dreadful organs, which I think is a sample from Super Mario World. It might not be, but it really reminds me of when you go into a dungeon, when you go to fight Bowser. Do, 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 do. It sounds so close to that. It's like a crazy horror comedy beat. What is an idea and can it progress the future? Another theme in this album is sort of existential questions and very kind of deep thoughts. He raps in a very calm and assured voice. Spectac then he raps like Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh yeah! So if, if you grew up, I don't know how old he is. He's got to be younger than me because he's got to be. But Macho Man Randy Savage was this wrestler. And I used to watch wrestling when I was a kid. And he had this way of talking, brother. He would talk in just a totally insane way. And he raps an entire, entire verse in the guise of spectacular object shining right in your eye. <laughs> yeah, but when you try to make contact, ooh, it disappears. Like, interesting idea. The next song is Misophonia Love. Oh. By the way, this album's like 25 minutes long. I'm 17 minutes into the video. You know how long this video is. I don't know, because I don't edit my videos. But I got a lot to say about this album. And this song is, this is the reason why I wanted to review this album, was because of this song. I mean, the rest of it too, but this was the hook. This is what got me to say, I know I've got to review this. And again, I think if we put this in conjunction with the Open Mic Eagle album of last year about divorce, it might go well. See, it's this whole song about like the, about misophonia is when you hate a sound. So it's a, it's a fake love song. It's basically like an imitation of I Need Love by LL Cool J. Like the beat has that kind of sound. Uh, which... My friend Jonathan used to torture me with that song. He used to play it for me every time I'd go over to his house. I'd be, you know, <laughs> of all the songs to play off of Bad, he played that song. It's in the back of the room, I hear my conscience call. So it's in an ironic register, the whole song, with this phone sound in the back. And misophonia is when you hate other sounds. So it's this ironic song where this guy is talking about these sounds that he makes that his partner hates. A, I got a chip, I ain't trying to hide it. I know I can drive you crazy when I bite it. Anticipating the sound of the crunch, the anxiety that you get, baby, is what I love. It turns me on the sexiness of your stress. This seems like a funny song, but it's really sad. Especially if you have a big personality. Especially if you're like a, a guy or a girl with a big motor, okay? like always talking about stuff, always thinking about stuff, always doing, and I assume this guy, if he's a, a comedian and a producer and a, and a MC, that he's one of these guys, just a big motor, just always going, thinking about jokes, talking about this, talking about this. Uh, it's hard to find a partner that doesn't like hate you. Like they might like you in the beginning and they might like parts of you, sort of, but at a certain point, 
you get on their nerves. They're enervated. They don't want to be with you. Actually, you know what? You just go on your own. I'll stay here. You start hearing that a lot. I think I might take a weekend to myself, right? Like, like when you got that big motor, it's hard not to, to turn people away. And misophonia, <laughs> the, the hatred that this woman feels about being with him for these sounds of just breathing, of eating a chip, it's funny, but I, like, it makes me cry because I've been in a relationship, like, fine relationships where eventually just me being aggravates the person I'm with to the point where they go crazy, which is terrible. Which is, which is why I'm not in that hole anymore, because, you know, my wife loves everything I do, even the stuff that bugs her, <laughs> you know? Like, I never had that feeling that, like, you know, like, I never get that feeling. It doesn't matter if, like, the way that, that like, you know, I cut melon, as I cut, I cut it, and there's just tons left on the rind, and then I just clean off the rind, but, and I just get water all over myself, just melon all over myself, I'm just a big mess. She hears that sound in the other room, she says, thank you for the watermelon. She doesn't say, I hate that sound. Would you stop making that sound? So that's the misophonia question. Do you see what I'm saying? It's funny. It's a funny song that the guy wrote in the ironic register. But what else could he do? That's why, like, we need comedy. Because it's hard to express feeling rejection from someone that you want to care for you. That's hard. Like, there's, <laughs> I got a whole bunch of books behind me, right? You know me, I'm Mr. Professor Man. Like, I'm an actual professor. I've read hundreds of books about love and art and all that stuff. It's really hard to express that kind of contempt that can come with time and, and, and just with over-familiarity. And this song does it. Next song is called Indifferent. Remember, I said I was going to talk to you about the screech. I don't know who is saying this. Hey, an artist has got to suffer. An artist has got to suffer. An artist has got to suffer over and over and over again. But I swear this is Judy Tenuta. Now, please tell me if I'm wrong. If you are a fellow goofball, goofball squatter, member of the Koreatown fan club, you can tell me who this actually is. It's definitely a stand-up comedy sketch, and it reminds me so much of Judy Tenuta. If you don't know Judy Tenuta, she was this, or I think she's still alive, but I haven't seen her perform in forever. A great, great comedian who performs with an accordion, and is weird and funny and very <laughs> aggravating. And we'll just, you have to watch, there's, <laughs> I, I, in preparation for this, I watched some of her clips. You have to see her on like, Good Morning Tampa. <laughs> She like, within like two minutes of starting to talk, she is writing, she is like, she has like a writing crop and is writing one of the members of the audience. It's really quite amazing. And, and this idea of an artist has got to suffer, like Judy Tenuta also is capable of, like, like any good comedian, communicating suffering while being really goofy. And then he's just singing over and over again. The song's basically a, a sung song. Am I indifferent or desensitized? A good question for us. Cool sample in the back and then just cutting up over and over again the grass no grass is greener it all gets fertilized simple profound it's like an interlude it's like a funny interlude but it's tying into this question of am i indifferent or desensitized next song is the title track is this for real which has some like cut up like robot sounds seems to be about the falseness in rap how can you tell with all the tricks and mirrors what y'all perceive that's authenticity me and my peers saw the ish is fake and seen through a facade ain't hate. You know what, K-Town, I don't get down that way. Seeing through a facade ain't, isn't hate. So that's a good line, <laughs> right? Just sit, sit with that one for a second. Seeing through a facade isn't hate. Makes sense. And that's, it's perceived of as hate. I mean, how many times in my life, I don't know how many times in your life, I have just seen things clearly and I tell someone something clearly, and then they go, you're just hating. I go, I, I'm not hating. I'm just saying this thing that is clearly true. Again, it's kind of a silly, funny idea, but it, and it's followed up immediately with a reference to The Simpsons, but it's very deep and good. He talks about how the voice on The Simpsons for Carl uh, is finally voiced by a black person, as opposed to, I think it was Hank Azaria, who did Carl's voice before. Um, Again, this guy. <laughs> two, okay, two, what the hell? 
you're 24 minutes into a review of a 25 minute album, I'm gonna tell you two more funny stories. One, a friend of mine, uh, his boyfriend's name was Carl Carlson, and I just couldn't let it go. I, there was just no part of me that did not find that funny. <laughs> and then the other thing is the word facade. Uh, one time, same friend, my friend Brad in high school, he used the word facade, and my buddy Paul was trying to like shame him for like being too snobby, and he just goes, precisely, professor! And we're all like, Paul, facade? That's not like a fancy word. You can't shame Brad for saying facade. <laughs> Precisely, professor. <laughs> Anyways. <clears throat> and then it gets super duper serious where it talks about his aunt, I think, whose name is Karen. It's like when you say Karen, I think of a, you think of a, a racist white B word, but I think of an aunt who is missed. And then ends the line, I wish you could say it was unusual to hop from a prom to a funeral. So there's a lot of trauma in this album that's just popped in around all the kind of comedy and weird, odd sounds. And then there's this ending here with a British person, and this is this, this British person character who is <laughs> telling the story about, the girl cut up my Gucci loafers, and then some black guys arrive, and he has to imitate a black voice, and so he does that. Again, it's the pain of having to perform certain versions of blackness in different categories, in like different places, right? Like I think, and I don't know, I don't know. I'm not talking like somebody who knows, I'm talking like somebody who believes people when they tell me stuff and who's trying to pay attention. Uh, I believe it must be very difficult to be in the public sphere and talking as a black man because so much is expected and so much is inferred from how you speak. Like, you, like, you, like I, don't, I don't think, well, certainly it's not as free as me, because I don't worry about, like, I don't think about how I'm perceived of when I speak. But, but maybe putting on this performance of this British guy is really emphasizing the performative nature of language in the first place. Although, you know, when I hung out with Paul, I did dumb down my vocabulary, so I don't know. I think he's a cop now. Nice guy. He's probably like the nicest cop in all of Massachusetts at this point. Anyways, cool kind of grimy sounds on the next song, Homeboys in Outer Space. <laughs> I remember Homeboys in Outer Space. That was a sitcom. It was on the WB or UPN or maybe Fox. I can't have been on for long. I remember just seeing the title and thinking it was funny. It was like a, it's like Star Trek, but like, but what if uh, a couple of funny black guys instead of Kirk and Spock? I don't remember if it was a good show or not, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's a good title at the very least. Great kind of cosmic sounds, like a chorus behind here. This is maybe the most interesting production here. Reminds me a lot of Dr. Octagon. Speaking of the need for comedy, you know, he was definitely providing a lot of that comedy when he wasn't being so gross. Like he was providing a lot of good comedy there. Okay. The movie Nope. So the movie Nope came out. I did a review of the movie yesterday, uh, two days ago, on my secondary channel. You can check it out. This this song like talks enough about stuff that sounds like it was maybe intended for a post-credit scene in Nope. Now I don't know if these guys again. I, I, I don't know, I, I, I know that the comedy scene in Los Angeles is huge. And being a comedian doesn't mean you know a different comedian. Being a black comedian doesn't, know you, doesn't mean you know another black comedian. But there's like UFO glows, a praying mantis, raw footage almost got damaged. Is this just me? Am I just crazy here? Homeboys in outer space, Whitey's on the moon. Nice reference to... Uh, Gil Scott Heron, and just, just the, mm, he has this way of playing with these words. Like, just, I'll ask you to do it. Just say these words. Just say these words for me. Homeboys in outer space, whitey's on the moon. See how agreeable that is? See what nice little sentence he put together here? He talks about hanging up on Elon Musk just for thinking I care about him. I like that. Weird sounds in the back, super pitched up. And then there's an interview with the British character. How did he learn how to talk like that? He just said that he went to Fatburger. 
Um, when I lived in Los Angeles, you know, there's everyone loves In and Out Burger, um, but I always went to Fat Burger, and uh, it's a hundred percent, a hundred percent because if you want to squirt her and take her to Fat Burger, it's because of that <laughs> super gross rap line. Um, but yeah, so if you ever go to LA, In and Out is run by a bunch of like super far-right Christians, which is okay. I mean, I, they, they're not like Chick-fil-A as far as their their policies, but they're kind of. And, and Fat Burger is just a better burger. Anyways, next song is called History Tension, produced by Taz Arnold. I believe it's the only beat produced by someone else. Um, I looked him up. He also produced You on To Pimp a Butterfly by uh, Kendrick Lamar. So like, wow, that's a good beat. This beat is tense. It's super tense. This album is a funny album that's super serious. The tension of history is attacking me. The tension of history is attacking me. The tension of history is attacking me. He just keeps saying it over and over again until you feel tense. For a little funny guy over here, he's got so much stuff that's making you tense as hell. <sighs> he talks about indifference. He talks about feeling nothing. It's sort of this dark side of this album. Next song is called Something or Nothing, which has a cool kind of click track in the beginning and then it's really heavy vinyl fuzz. A lot of existential questions. Uh, there's, I think it's Guru from Gangstar. I don't remember which song, but you hear him saying the Roma of the Blunts. Um, nice female voice singing along. This is basically just, a, just an R&B song. And then... We have another one of these jokes with the, with the British guy who has to say hello to his white fans. And it's slightly different than the way he's saying hello to his black fans. Like this, the, the, the fineness of this question of performative language. It's just great. Next song is Hello, which I've already talked about. Existential Landlord is just some woman talking. It's like this weird, like, I think, like, African sample in the back, like African music. I can't tell what part of Africa. Sounds like some kind of flute instrument in there. And I just love the idea that this is his landlord. <laughs> I love this idea. I don't know if this is what he's going for. The idea I get is that this is his landlord, like coming for the check. <laughs> and, and just sitting there and just being like, I just want to exist. And if, if I could be a cloud that's also a mountain, and like <laughs> just at the very end, you know, it's going to be like, also... Dude, it's the th third week of the month, you know, like, I need the money. The album ends with an endless run, pulsing, upbeat, kind of quiet beat, very existential here. What is the signal for Nns to know what direction Ish is going to go? He's just singing about how we'll never know anything about the future. This kind of, this is like, if this album is about comedy and pain, this is the pain part. Does it come with status rise, choosing size, salad or fries, people with the saddest eyes stuck between the hands of time and the land that they despise just to create better lives, get your slice of devil pie, they lay inside a web of lies, they wonder why we ain't civilized, we wonder why they can't empathize, might get more cane, uh, caned in replies when I arrive in my disguise with my eyes wide shut. They wonder why we ain't civilized, we wonder why they can't empathize, interesting, just deep. And then it kind of ends with some like voice saying, what more is there to say? So it's a dense, wonderfully funny, wonderfully disturbing, dark album. It's, it's a dark comedy album, you know? But it doesn't, it doesn't feel that way. Like it, it never feels like it's trying to be ponderous. Like you don't listen to it and go, oh, I feel bad. Like you listen to it, I feel good. <laughs> and then you think about what's actually being said and you're like, I, I feel okay. <laughs> Anyways, there you go. Create Town Oddity. Is this for real? Um, do you smash the like bucket? I already said that, so I'm all good. Um, yeah, there's the camera.